Hello, BookTube. Well, I wasn't really thinking about making a March TBR uh, because I plan on reading a lot of books in March, a lot of them, uh, every major new release that I can get my hands on in March and all the minor ones that I can get my hands on. Uh, but all the cool kids are making March TBRs on BookTube, including, of course, my favorite BookTuber, Jack Edwards, <laughs> who made a video titled All the Books I Will Be Reading in March. I am not going to do that. Uh, I'm, this is not, I have some books to show you that I will definitely either be reading or rereading in March, but it's not all of them. Uh, it's a tiny fraction of them. I, so I will be talking about March books throughout the month of March, I would imagine. So I want to show you some of those, maybe talk about some of them. Quite a few of them here are things I have not read yet, so I don't have anything to say about them. The first one is by a, co a collaboration between Elliot Ackerman and Admiral James Stavridis. Uh, I've read and reviewed Admiral Stavridis' book, one of his books, and I've read and reviewed Elliot Ackerman. Uh, both of them, but I've never viewed their collaboration. I don't believe this is the first time. I think we've seen an earlier collaboration from them. This is 2054. They're doing a series of uh, projection novels, thriller novels that project what the world will be like down the line. Uh, they're, they're both uh, really passionate, futuristic type thinkers. What, what factors that we're looking at today will play out in the future and how will that happen i find that fascinating and i don't know about uh jim stavides but i uh, elliot ackerman's a terrific writer he, he can do no wrong so uh, i imagine that i'll enjoy it i remember if i remember correctly i enjoyed their previous collaboration then we have something by jonathan Haidt, who did the uh the unclosing of the american or the what's the name of the something of the american mind that he did uh it was a hit I, i'm blanking on the title right now but his new book is the anxious generation uh, about kids on their cell phones, basically, and what what it all means, what what kind of a generation it's producing. Uh, I really like him as a writer. I, I love how provocative he is on the page, how readable he is on the page. But I worry about this book. The this this subject, uh, you know, kids these days is always tricky. Uh, for a number of reasons not uh, one once you are a settled middle-aged man with a family and a mortgage and a whole bunch of opinions that you're not going to change if jesus himself came back and told you to uh you are as far away from understanding unformed young people as you can get and you are not going to realize that most men in jonathan hates age do not realize that and that's fatal <laughs> that's right that's a, that's a fatal misjunction is that they they no longer know anybody young who is not their slave who's not financially and personally geographically dependent on them they don't know any young people otherwise and would never do it they would never have jonathan Haidt would never have a young person as a friend a child maybe one of his children he might somehow like or some of their friends he might know but as a friend i mean as an equal you get to say things i get to say things i don't have any there's there's complete equality here he doesn't have any i guarantee i don't know him but i guarantee you he doesn't have any young friends that's one of the elements that makes this book a little difficult to to anticipate with a clean, happy heart. And another is a thing that older writers tend not to realize when they're researching these books. Hayes is a good researcher. One of the things you're going to research about a book like this, of course, is going to be surveys. Long-term, wide-scale surveys about what large generational issues are pressing on the minds of young people. And this generation of young people, the kind of generation, of, uh, the, young, the generation of young people that was raised on a phone, in many ways raised by a phone, and who has known from early on in their lives, grade school, basically known as long as they could coherently think, that there is them and then there is their profile, there is their avatar, there is the, the self that they assemble online and present to the rest of the world. All of them want that self to go viral and make them money. Most of them keep a difference between that self and themselves. If that's making any sense. I'm sure that to some of you it is making sense. But it is definitely true. It is completely endemic to young people. There are two of them. There are two young people. And it's not the same kind of split that it might have been in my generation where you were you, but you also lied to your parents every once in a while. That's not the same thing. We're talking about two separately and carefully maintained personae. Two versions of yourself. And when people research this generation, Generation I, or whatever you want to call it, when people research this generation, older people simply do not take that into account. They do not take into account that it's the avatar who's answering the survey, not the person. 
and the avatar has, is a different person. They can completely lie. What we would, what I would consider a lie, but it isn't a lie for the avatar. It isn't a lie for the social construct that the teen has created so far in their life. If that makes any sense at all. Uh, so you see this in all kinds of ways. I, I don't know how much research Jonathan Haidt has done for this book. I'll find out. But you see this in all kinds of ways. Uh, I have seen this in all kinds of ways, where the young person's avatar, for instance, does not smoke or vape. The young person does constantly. They have the, uh, the lung capacity of a little baby. They have a drug addiction so bad that they might as well be a 1930s dock worker. But their avatar doesn't. And so when you ask them, do you, they say, no, I don't. And it's the eye straddles both those things. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. I guess what I'm trying to say is when I read this book, my main worry will be that it is that horrible phrase, out of touch. In which case it will be worthless, which is another horrible phrase. <laughs> then we'll move on to uh, Regency Romance. This is a modern Regency Romance, so it's, it's full of uh, salacious bits. This is uh, Bewitching the Beast, and it is by Amy Sandus. I think I've read one book by this author. It sounds from the title like this is a Beauty and the Beast takeoff in the Regency era. Uh, we will see. I, I, I will be happy to read it, but uh, uh, I've been in the mood lately for my old-fashioned Regency romances, so I don't know how this might, this might, it might not be the right time to read this, in which case that's bad, because I think there's another one on this list. Then this next one is by Keith O'Brien. This is Charlie Hustle, a new book about Pete Rose, the rise and fall of Pete Rose, who was expelled ignominiously from the game of baseball for cheating, for betting on games that he was taking part in. Uh, this is a baseball book. It's uh, it's not my particular field of influence. I am very much hoping that I can get Zach from the Brattle to read this and opine about it. That would be wonderful. Uh, but I will still read it. I, I want him to read it and then write about it. But I, I, I will still read it and see what kinds of what kind of a job the author does. For instance, the main job of all, does the author forget that some of his readers don't know baseball? If he does, well, then the book will fail. For me, it will fail. Uh, if he doesn't, then he will bring me up to speed, and that would be great. Then we have something I've shown you before. This is Natalie Dykstra. I have not yet read this. This is Chasing Beauty, a new biography of Isabella Stewart Gardner. There she is, throwing wide the doors to her abode. Uh, she was... Uh, an odd society, a society figure, a diminutive nitwit, a, a wonderful talker, wonderful personality here in Boston. And her name adorns the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum here in Boston, which is an absolute must see if you come to the city. Uh, and she's had a number of biographies. She's in a, I mean, a bit of a weird position with her because I've known more than one of her biographers. And I don't know Natalie Dykstra at all. Uh, but I don't know also what else can be done aside from those other biographies. So I guess I'll find out. It, ultimately, right, it's not about new material or new archives opening or anything. It's about what you do with the material. I think I'm not the only person who learned that when with Stacey Schiff's biography of Cleopatra, for God's sake. Talk about well-trod ground. And I loved it. So easily could happen again. Then we have Jay Kristoff. This is, uh, we've seen this already. This is Empire of the Damned. Still haven't got to this. I'm still, uh, I'd still kind of like to read uh, Empire of the Vampire, the, the first book in this series, about a suddenly dark world, an earth that's gone suddenly dark so there's no more daylight for vampires to worry about. An elaborate cosmology and supernatural superstructure is created all around that event of never night, uh, of never day, of, of day's death uh, with all kinds of vampires and super vampires and other things. Empire of the Vampire is crammed full of stuff. Immensely readable. Immensely readable fantasy. And this is the sequel at half the length. I just, I, I could have read this by now, but I, I keep telling myself, you know, I should, you should reread Empire of the Vampire first, and I haven't done that because it's a big book. Uh, then we have, uh, who's the author here? Uh, Derek Gunn. Hunt for the Shadow Wolf is the next book. Haven't read this, but this is about uh, it's right up my alley. It's about the history of, of large wild canines in the British Islands. Uh, when they were there, what we know about them, how they impinge on the historical record, and especially how they went away, how they were exterminated. Uh, wolves, that is, uh, in Ireland and in England and in Scotland. Uh, not so much foxes, 
of course. Foxes have not been exterminated. They are everywhere. Uh, but wolves, there's a storied history there. And I don't know what take this author will take here. I don't know if this author will lend any credence or even look in the direction of the persistent uh, crypto mythology that wolves are not extinct in the British Isles. They certainly are. <laughs> okay, that's okay. They, they certainly are. I can't talk anything about Australian Aboriginal myths of any kind, but I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt there are no wolves anywhere in the British Isles that are wild. They might be in zoos. There are none out in the wilderness, because I've been over every inch of that wilderness with dogs. And if there had been wolves there, there were foxes there. <laughs> I can attest to that directly, but if there had been wolves, I would have known. I don't think the author will go in that direction, though, so we, we will see. It would probably just be really good, popular natural history. Then we have Tana French, a um, thriller author that a lot of you love. I want to love her. I don't, I don't love her as much as the rest of you do. I barely like her. She has a new book, The Hunter. I will certainly give it a try. I, I dipped my toe in it, and it seemed very much the same as her other books. So uh, we will see. And then also in March, uh, an author I love, uh, and I have been postponing dipping my toe into this book, out of fear, out of fear that I am not going to like it, which is weird. That's, what, that's the peril that comes to you when you start to like an author. I shouldn't care about that. I should be willing to go after anybody's jugular at any time. But the author is Percival Everett, and this is his new book, James, a retelling of Huck Finn, centering on the slave Jim. Uh, and I, I don't want to hate this book. I don't want this author to have written a book that I hate. And so I'm avoiding it. <laughs> that, that is not good. In March, I certainly have to read it. I doubt I will review it. Uh, then I think I've shown you this before. This is Josiah Bunting the Third, and this is the making of a leader, the formative years of George Marshall, uh, famous for the Marshall Plan. There he is as a young, handsome psychopath, and I, I uh, am much more familiar with the, his later years when he was the most famous military figure, the most famous soldier in the world, as one person said. Uh, I'm not familiar with his younger years, but I know what I'm going to find in this book. My whole question will be how it's done. I'm hoping that Josiah Bunting really, really entertains me. Because uh, the subject is not, the subject is Stone Cold Killer. So I'm, I'm hoping that the, that the book is wonderful. Uh, then we have something that I really doubt I'm going to like this, but uh, I will give it a try. This is Armistead Mopin, who was famous, I don't know, 85, 90 years ago for Tales of the City. Uh, I guess you could say a groundbreaking series of of, no, of gay novels made into a an equally groundbreaking TV miniseries. Uh, I have never liked uh, Tales from the City novels all that much. They've always struck me as tiptoeing along a very uncomfortable line between social commentary and ridiculous screaming camp. I have no patience whatsoever for ridiculous screaming camp. None whatsoever, especially not when it is the byproduct, not of artistic impulse, but of the fact that you live in a persecuted minority, and that stress has got to go somewhere. I, 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 when that's where it comes from, I can't stand it, and I, I've always, I've always detected way. I know I should like Tales from the City, of course I should, but I never have. And Marston Mobin has a new Tales of the City book, uh, Mona of the Manor. Now. I myself think that after the third Tales of the City book, the story had been told. That was it. That was all you needed to do. Of course, there were all sorts of other things that he needed to tell, all sorts of characters that he needed to excavate, and also there was money. Right? You have a built-in audience for this. I would have to think that most of that audience is dead by now. Uh, and there's also you. Armistead Mopan has got to be 80. I, I, no, I'm not saying that you can't write a good book when you're 80, but I don't know. The, I, I will, I will read this and I will report back. I, when I see it, I have just this horrible feeling of, of just going through the motions. But I could be wrong. Who knows? I, I could be wrong. Uh, this next one is by Robert Zubrin, and this is the New World on Mars, about, um. Uh, well, I, I haven't read it, so I don't know what tack the author will take. It will either be about homesteading on Mars, or it will be about terraforming Mars. Those are two radically different subjects. Homesteading on Mars would mean building encampments underneath the surface of Mars, walling them off. They would have their 
they would have, they would not be connected with the planet Mars at all, and they would be under the surface because the surface of Mars is bombarded by lethal radiation 24 hours a day. In addition to being brutally cold, you you could not the you would be magnifying the costs of homesteading on Mars by a factor of a thousand to do it on the surface as opposed to doing it underground. Literally, the surface would be a thousand times more expensive uh, and more dangerous. So, I, on the one hand, you have homesteading Mars, where you would be under you would be under the surface, and then on the other hand, you have terraforming Mars. Which this cover seems to imply that you've got a plant sprouting on Mars that we're we're at least five thousand years from that happening. Hate to say it, hate to bur hate to burst the bubble, but we're at least and that would be five thousand years of concerted global effort to make it happen. And how likely is that? In order to terraform Mars, you would have to change its orbit. You would have to develop an atmosphere. Nothing can happen on Mars. No no nuclear chains can 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 accumulate in a world that's being bombarded by radiation. That's, that's, that can't happen. So you would need to change that fact. And in order to change that fact, you would have to build an atmosphere on Mars. You would have to change Mars so that its electromagnetic field is strong enough to strain out a lot of that radiation. That's a long, long, long task. So I don't know which this author is going to do. Maybe this will just be a hypothetical book that just spins hypotheticals about both those things. That would be fascinating. Mars has an incredible allure to it, even though when it comes to homesteading, let's leave terraforming out for a minute, because terraforming would require the whole world to be involved, and the whole world is not acting in unison now, and is not likely to any time in the future. Uh, but homesteading on Venus would be much easier to do than homesteading on Mars, because on Venus you could homestead in the clouds. You couldn't homestead below the clouds of sulfuric acid. The raining acid on, on the surface of Venus, which is like 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So you couldn't homestead on the surface of Venus, but the clouds are, cover the whole world. We can't see the surface of Venus at all. And they receive uninterrupted sunlight. So you could, you could float cities on those clouds and homestead there. That is far more likely. Uh, than Mars, but we'll see what this author does. We'll see, you know, how interested the author is in any of these possibilities. And then this next one is by author Goldwag. I don't, this is going to be tough to read. I'll be irritated the whole time. I'll do it. Uh, this is the, the politics of fear, the particular persistence of American paranoia. And there we have the QAnon shaman, uh, from January 6th insurrection. Uh, I don't know how much of this will be stem winding or how much of it is interview based or whatnot, but I'll give it a try. Then David Charter has a new book called Royal Audience, uh, which is decades of U.S. presidents meeting with uh, Queen Elizabeth II. Basically, Queen Elizabeth II. I'm sure that maybe maybe her father will be in here just a bit. Uh, maybe. Uh, maybe the, the Duke and Duchess visiting Franklin Roosevelt at Franklin Park or, whatever, or Hyde Park. Uh, but I think mostly this will be presidents meeting with Queen Elizabeth II. I, I know, if it is that, I know all of these anecdotes anyway, I, but we'll see what the author does with them. You, you never know. Then another uh, another modern Regency romance. I would have read this anyway. It's a Paul Marin book, so I can't, I can't ignore it. But this is uh, by Amelia Gray, who I love. I don't know the other Regency author all that well for, by name recognition, but Amelia Gray, I've read a lot of books by her, and I really like them. This is Sincerely the Duke. And once again, the man is topless, where that would never happen in the Regent Sierra. So they are, the man is topless, the woman is unchaperoned, he has his, his mauling all over her. You have to just make your allowances for those kind of contemporary sudsy stuff from modern romances when you're reading new Regencies. And I do. I have plenty of these things. I enjoy them quite a bit. Uh, and Amelia Gray, I, I enjoy anyway. So uh, Then we have something by Timothy Rybeck. I showed you this before, I think. I haven't got around to reading it. It's a March release, and I will. This is about Hitler's rise to power. It's called The Takeover. And there he is shaking hands with the man who let it happen. The man who could have gone to the nearest radio before those radios were controlled, before there were brown shirts with guns standing on either side of every radio in the country. That man could have gone to a radio and said, I denounce this man and everything he stands for. Do not. His government is not legitimate. I will not work with him. You should not work with him. 
That would have ended things, but no, <laughs> but no. Uh, this, so this is also going to be necessarily depressing reading. Uh, then, uh, speaking of necessarily depressing reading, we shall see. This is this is an odd thing. I'll have to I'll have to see. I'll have to research this thing. This is called Until August, and it is apparently an, a discovered novel of Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Uh, I'm assuming that means discovered in the English translation market. I'm assuming that everything that he knew is known in his own language. Uh, that everything he wrote is already known in his own language. There wasn't any any book knocking around in the bottom of a cabinet somewhere. I don't know the provenance of this thing, but it's, it's you know, that strangest phrase of all, a new Gabriel Garcia Marquez, so I will definitely give it a try. Uh, then we have Roman historical fiction uh, for There's No Place Like Rome. Uh, this is by Simon Turney, who's done a couple of Roman historical series uh, that I really enjoy. Very action-oriented, very plot-driven. There's nothing there's nothing revelatory in these things, but they are really enjoyable as page-turners. And he is starting a new one. He's starting a new series, the Agricola series. And if you know your classical literature, will know will know Tacitus wrote a book about Agricola <laughs> and about a character named Agricola. And here we get uh, Agricola Invader. This is the first book in the series. This is all Roman Britain where Agricola is uh, is appended to the staff of Suetonius Paulinus, who is who is in charge of Roman Britain and who is a major figure, who had a really big, really good novel of his own decades and decades ago that I've never found in the wild. I read it out of a library. I've never seen it otherwise. Uh, I, you know, like I mentioned with a couple of other things here, Hitler's rise to power or the, the QAnon shaman and all the events connected with January 6th or anything like that. I know all of this history, so we will see what uh, Simon Turney does with it. Uh, I think I know what he will do with it. There, there are, uh, I don't know if you can tell, but on this cover there are no less than, no fewer than two mistakes. But only with the imagery. He wouldn't have had anything to say about that, I would imagine. Uh, this will be, it'll be Paulinus, and it will be probably the run-up to, to the Boudicca revolt, and it'll be really enjoyable. I know that. I really enjoy this author, so I will, I will just see what he has to do with it. I'm, his main character will be an impressionable young man here, I would imagine, so that'll be a change. Uh, then we have, uh, this is by Doug Carey, and this is The Berman Murders. This is... Uh, an unsolved murder case from the late 1980s. Uh, the the Kahlua liqueur guy. I'm sure if you if you bend your liquor store on on the interstate, you've seen Kahlua liquor. That's a, a hugely expensive empire. The guy who's that was him, and he was so he had more money than God. He and his wife were were vacationing out in the desert and in Arizona, and uh, they went missing. And years later, their bodies were found in a, in a grave. And it just someone had, not an official grave, someone had dug a pit and put them in there. And there have been no arrests. There, there, there was no, there's been no action on this case. It's still, it's still open. And this author, from what I gather about this book, I need to do a lot more research. From what I gather about this book, this author not only digs over everything again, but also develops a theory of the case and a suspect. Uh, so we will see. That can be very, very interesting to do. Uh, if I'm not a little bit serial killer, if I'm not a little bit real world, true crime murdered out, which uh, if I'm not now, I guarantee you by the end of the summer I will be. Uh, this next one is Stephen Dando Collins. He is a popular classical historian, and I have a spotty record with him. I'm not always a fan of what he does. Some things I like, other things I think are I just don't know what. I don't know what they are. And uh, this one could go either way. This is his new book, Caesar versus Pompey, uh, where two old former allies and even relatives by marriage, uh, Caesar and Pompey the Great, square off for possession of the world. Uh, so this will be, this is extremely well-trod ground. This is extremely well-documented ground. We'll just see what Dando Collins makes of it. And again, if I can remember, I will leave a link to any reviews of him that I did. But again, if I don't remember, just, if you're curious, uh, just go to Google and type in my name and his name, and that ought to do it. Uh, then this next one is a uh, an anniversary reprint of a classic science fiction anthology, Dangerous Visions, by Harlan Ellison. I forget who's doing the, the reprint, but it's it's coming out, I think, in a new hardcover. 
uh, with a new introduction and a new preface and whatnot in March or maybe April. Uh, I revisited uh, Dangerous Visions for, I think, New World's November? Uh, just a couple of years ago, here on BookTube. I revisited it for the first time in decades, and, oh my god, I did not like the experience. At all. I did not like the experience. I, it, it was a real stark case of revisiting a book seriously damaging what I thought about it. Because until then, until that reread, I'd been perfectly happy to just blandly say about this what everybody else does, which is that it's one of or the greatest science fiction anthology ever put together by anyone. I do not think that anymore. And I don't know if maybe that experience was heightened by the cold water feel of it all. So I will try this again. I will get this reissue and try it again. Uh, then we have Every Man's Library. This is a lovely volume that they're coming out with, Byron's Travels. Uh, all of the stuff. There'll be poems and journal entries here, but most especially there'll be letters of all of Lord Byron on the move. This will be a, vo a Byron volume to really have. I Again, like with so many other books here on this March TBR that Jack Edwards made me do, uh, I will know a lot of this stuff. I've read all of Byron's letters. I've read all of his journals. I've read all of his poems many, many times. I know his travels. I've read other people's accounts of them and every account in every biography. But this will be different. There'll probably be a new introduction. They'll, and seeing them all prized together, pulled out of their original context in a lot of cases, will make for a different reading experience. I, this will be an Everyman Library volume to have if you're a Byron fan. Uh, then another author that I'm a fan of, I confess I get more of a fan of this author the older I get. Uh, the author is uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And this is a book by James Marcus called Glad to the Brink of Fear. It's called A Portrait of Emerson, and I don't know what that means. I, I That could be very promising. It, it The book goes out of its way not to call itself a biography of Emerson. Uh, and I don't know what that means. That could mean that Marcus is going to give himself a little poetic leeway. I'm all in favor of that, provided it's done well. We'll see. I'm not going to miss this. In any case, I wouldn't, I wouldn't miss this. So uh, Then we have uh, the Jewish Live series. This has been going on forever and ever. I've reviewed a few, a few numbers in this series. They're, little, they're thin little books, little biography or biographical treatments of famous Jews. And the new one is by Martin Goodman, and it is Herod the Great. <laughs> so this is a very bright cover, so that's going to wash out a bit. But uh, Herod, it, so in other words, it, does, it just has to be a famous Jew. It doesn't have to be a nice Jew. <laughs> Herod the Great was not a nice person, uh, by all accounts. We will see. Uh, well, the thing, I'll, this thing, they're tiny. They're like 100 pages long. The thing that I'll be curious about in this book is uh, what kind of work Goodman does. How far afield of the Gospels is he going? Because you can go plenty far. There's a lot about Herod. I wonder how much of it will be brought together in this little book. I don't know about it because that would require a lot of work. And I imagine for books and series like Jewish Lives or American Presidents or whatever, I don't imagine that the paycheck is very big. And if you're a working writer, you would look at that paycheck and you would scale by that paycheck how much work you're going to do. So I don't know that, that this, unless I don't know anything about Martin Goodman, maybe he's already an expert on Herod and his times. Um, if he isn't, I don't know how much more he'll do for the work. I hate to say it in such mercantile terms, but that's the way the industry works. Uh, so we, we will see. We will see. Uh, then this next one, I don't know if I ever showed you this last year. This is a novel by Alice Wynn. I really enjoyed it. It's one of those novels that stuck with me. It's called In Memoriam. No novel should be called that. There should be a complete moratorium on that title. No one should ever be able to use that title again, but if you're going to use it, fine. And it didn't look anything like the paperback. The paperback is coming out in March or April. I'm going to work hard to get the paperback because I have the hardcover still, and I, the paperback is much more elegant. Uh, this, oh God, oh my God, you're never going to be able to see it in here after I've talked about it like that. Can you maybe make it out? That, there we go. That's good enough. This is the paperback. This is a, a historical novel, World War I historical novel. Whole bunch of different narrative threads running through here, but the main one is a rather touching, uh, almost completely thwarted gay love story about a soldier who is deeply in love with one of his colleagues and the colleague doesn't know it and the soldier doesn't know that the colleague is also deeply in love with him fascinated maybe not in love because you'd have to say it in order for that to happen but fa erotically fascinated personally fascinated and it's amazing how effectively alice Wynn measures that off against the much weightier aspects of the war i 
I was looking at my 2023, I still have all my 2023 books, the ones that survived the whole year of culling and reshaping and reculling. I still have that whole bookcase together. I haven't scattered them to the winds yet. And I was looking at that bookcase just the other day and saw that book and thought immediately, oh, I, you know, that has been bothering me. I, it's been sticking with me, not in a bad way. I want to reread that. And now I'm not going to. I'm not going to reread the book that I have. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get the paperback and, and read it. Now, then we have Taya Obrey, I, I, the author of the, the Tiger's Wife from 15 years ago or 20 years ago or whatever. Uh, that book enchanted me so much that I've read everything that she's done. I really, really enjoy her work. And she has a new book coming out, The Morning Star, or The Morning Side. I think, it, the, if I remember correctly from the little that I know about it, it has a little bit of uh, magical realism in it. Uh, I don't really care. This is a case where the author's credit in the Bank of Steve is so high uh, that I'll read, I'll read anything, even as an experiment. If I don't like it, I'm still going to like the author. Same thing with this next person. This is, this is definitely an author read. The author is Brad Gooch who has written a lot of biographies that I really like. His newest biography I've been putting off and putting off. I will read it in March. The reason I've been putting it off is not because of him. He's terrific as a writer. It's because of the subject. The subject is Keith Haring, who is a, a posturing, talentless moron. So I, this is going to be rough. It's going to be like, when I, what's a good example? Uh, uh, Jed Pearl's two-volume biography of the artist Calder. Calder is a fraud, a completely talentless fraud, just a, an utterly ridiculous sham on the art market uh, that people just, <laughs> and, and yet Pearl wrote two huge, a two volume, huge biography of him that was wonderful. It was absolutely wonderful. So there I was going for the, the writer, was, Pearl can do no wrong. And very much not for the subject because Calder is a fraud. He's ridiculous to read about him in you know great man terms. Uh, same thing here, exactly the same thing here. I will just be holding my nose while I read about the character, and then we'll finish up with popular history. Hampton Sides. I just reread uh, a book of his. I think it was called The Kingdom of the Ice. Uh, and a lot of you will know him. He's written a lot of popular history. He tends to write explorey out in the wilderness -y type books that uh, where he goes over the primary material, maybe finds some new things, has a new angle. Really energetic writer, really, really good. I doubt, if you've read a Hampton Sides book, I doubt you haven't liked it. Uh, and he has a new book coming out in either March or April called The Wide, Wide Sea, which is about the last voyage of Captain Cook and his death. Uh, because that that's the shadow that hangs over any writing that you do about Captain Cook is his famous death where he's, he's famously murdered on a beach. He doesn't get to die in his bed with all the honors in the world. Doesn't be, get to become prime minister. None of that stuff. All the stuff that might have crossed someone else's mind about him. The prime minister certainly didn't cross Cook's mind. But but now is a sailor home from the sea, all that sort of business. I'm sure that in the back of his mind on long voyages, he was thinking, someday this life will be over and I'll retire with honors to my, my manor in the countryside. And the great and the good of the country will come and see me, but all of this will be, this toil will be over. This, this urge, this wanderlust will be over. I am sure that at no point did he think that he would have the end that he did, his head bashed out on a, on a beach. Uh, so that'll be hanging over this book too. <laughs> That's what this book is about. We'll see. We'll see what else Sides has to say. I'm hoping that he doesn't politicize things too much. I'm hoping this isn't, that it isn't 60% a screed about colonization and first contact and whatnot. Uh, we will see. My main, I am a big fan of Captain Cook. I, I, my main interest in this book will be, uh, does it have an element of popular history reading that I usually don't get with Hampton Sides just because he goes to subjects that I don't know about? I've almost never had to ask of him the question that I often ask of popular historians, which is, does this author know more than I do about the subject? In this particular case, I am going to have to ask that question. Does this author know more about the subject than I do? I'm not barring the book if he doesn't. I, there have been a couple of books on this March TBR where it's it's kind of unlikely that the author knows more about the subject than I do. It is not, frankly, possible that Stephen Dando Collins knows more about Caesar and Pompey than I do. Uh, so it's not a bar at all. I could still, I will still read books like that, and I could still very much enjoy them. Uh, in This, is, I think, will be the first time that I've ever encountered that with Hampton Sides, where he's hitting a subject that I know a lot about. 
we'll see. We'll see if that changes the rationale at all. But that is that is the beginnings, anyway, of a March TBR. I was seeing all the cool kids doing it, and I wanted to do it myself. The only other question I have for you, well, aside from your March TBR, what are your March reading plans? Is BookTube just taking them over? There's so many events in BookTube. It could be just a BookTube month. But another question that I have, another thing that the cool kids have been doing is a February wrap-up where they, they look back at their February reading-wise. I don't think I've done many wrap-ups on this channel. But when I see the cool kids doing it, I automatically want to. I Like everybody else, I want to be Ollie when I grow up. <laughs> so, so should I do a February wrap-up? I don't even know what form it would take. I can't talk about 111 books <laughs> in, in one video. I'll have to figure it out. I'll figure it out. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap this up for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, BookTube.